of this man was an eight inch nail that had been driven through his ankle and there were portions of wood on it to show that it had also been driven into wood. This archaeological discovery provided historians with physical evidence of first century crucifixions. The whole process was designed by the Romans to cause the maximum amount of pain, the maximum amount of humiliation, and it is actually the most horrific form of execution ever devised by man. Skeptics believe that Jesus actually survived his crucifixion and that he faked his own death in order to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. But because of historical records, we know for certain that would have been impossible. Now, some people try to say that Jesus swooned on the cross and somehow got off the cross alive. Well, first of all, if a person who was being executed by the Romans was not dead at the end of the process, the people in charge of the execution themselves would be executed. But secondly, from everything that I've described about the medical process, there is absolutely no possibility that he could have survived that. He was absolutely, positively, absolutely dead at the time he came down off the cross. Any idea that is otherwise is completely absurd. Coming up, a new religion is on the rise and its believers are willing to die for their beliefs. Is this proof that the New Testament is pure and irrefutable fact? After confirming his death, Jesus' family and followers were anxious to give him a proper burial before sundown and the start of the Sabbath. A wealthy man named Joseph of Arimathea asked Pontius Pilate for Jesus' body so that he may honor him with a traditional Jewish burial. Joseph had recently contracted for his own tomb to be carved out of a large rock and it is there that he laid Jesus to rest. A first century tomb is easy to spot. We have many examples, archaeological examples, of first century tombs. A heavy wheel-shaped stone was rolled over the entrance to the tomb and a Roman guard was placed on duty as the Sanhedrin were concerned that Jesus' disciples would steal his body and claim he had risen from the dead. They were sealed on the front. They had a very small opening in the front, you had to bend over to go into the tomb, and the first thing you saw was a big room, an anteroom, and then you saw other rooms that led off to the sides where burials would take place. On Sunday, Mary and Mary Magdalene brought spices and oils in hopes of anointing Jesus' body, but when they arrived at the tomb, they discovered that the rock had been rolled aside and the tomb was empty. were startled by an angel who told them that Jesus of Nazareth had risen from the dead. He instructed them to alert Peter and the disciples that Jesus will meet up with them in Galilee. Women were not considered to be reliable witnesses in a court of law. It is unusual then that the first line of witness and testimony to the resurrection of Jesus comes from the women in the Gospels. The testimony of a woman in the first century was not even valid. It was worthless in a court of law. If the early church was inventing the resurrection, it surely would not have chosen women to be the first line of defense. It is almost a sure thing that the tomb was actually found empty. The original Jewish polemic against the, the uh, resurrection assumes that the tomb was actually empty. Having risen from the dead, Jesus first appeared to Mary Magdalene. Master! Later, he appeared to two strangers who didn't recognize him. He walked along with them as they told the astonishing story of this simple carpenter from Galilee who was wrongly crucified. Jesus finally appeared before his apostles, who were stunned and could not believe their own eyes. After Jesus was resurrected, he appeared to people. He appeared to Peter. He appeared to the Twelve. 
He appeared to 500 at one time. And he appeared over the course of 40 days. A lot of people say those were hallucinations. It's impossible according to psychologists today. Another key piece of evidence to the story of the resurrection is that believers and witnesses maintain that Jesus ascended into heaven in the face of persecution by the Sanhedrin. Within a few short weeks, they are in the very streets of Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified. They're in the very streets of Jerusalem defying the religious leadership and proclaiming the messiahship of Jesus and the resurrection. The disciples were transformed from doubters who were afraid to identify themselves with Jesus to bold proclaimers of his uh, deity and his resurrection. They're on the streets and they're preaching that Jesus has been resurrected and they're willing to experience persecution and ultimately death for that. Many of the disciples underwent brutal persecution for what they believed to be true. The apostles uh, undertook great risk uh, to share Christ. They were persecuted, some were martyred. Stephen, for example, was stoned to death. Some were beaten and left for dead in the hopes that they had been martyred, but of course survived. By their own confession, they did what they did because they were convinced they saw Jesus alive physically after his crucifixion. All four Gospels break off with Jesus ascending into heaven, but only Luke's Book of Acts shows what happens in the intervening segment between the end of Jesus' ministry and the birth of the church. The stories in Acts chronicle the beginnings of the church, starting with the apostles who knew Jesus personally. But in time, the seeds of faith spread across the earth influencing beliefs in all parts of the world. Here we have the record of how all these little molecules, you might say, of the faith got seeded and how they grew into what is today the most successful single phenomenon statistically considered in the history of the world. Luke, the evangelist, is credited with writing the book of Acts. Luke's precise technical writing style authenticates his authorship. Now, Luke was a doctor by profession. He was a very educated and erudite man. And if you look at the language of Luke and Acts, it was written like a, a Greek classic. The nice thing about the book of Acts is the absolute realism. It's first-rank history. But can we really believe what Luke tells us? Are the events described in the book of Acts a true account of the times? Or were the stories embellished, even fabricated, simply to advance their message of Jesus? Was it all just an elaborate hoax? It's not even the critics of Christianity believe that's the case. They might believe that they were mistaken, that they may have had spiritual experiences, but certainly not an intentional hoax of any sort. And then to expect that they went on to the rest of their lives uh, propagating this hoax that they knew was false, and then eventually many of them were martyred and tortured even before that. That is a, almost a greater miracle than to posit the idea of Jesus' physical resurrection. As the apostles' preaching began, winning new followers of Christ from Jewish communities, many Jewish laws were altered or abandoned. This dramatic, dogmatic shift is startling to historians and further proves the accuracy of the accounts. It is quite striking then, when you look at the practices of the early church in a Jewish context as well as moving on into the Gentile world, where significant aspects of the Jewish beliefs and practices were altered in the name of Jesus. Circumcision isn't as important. Uh, eating with Gentiles is okay now. Eating foods that aren't kosher is okay now. You also have the uh, transference of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. These are drastic changes for a Jewish group of people. The only way to explain that is that something happened. Does this Jewish conversion phenomenon give credence to the scriptures? Many believe that their change was only possible if Jesus had actually been resurrected. Rather inexplicable if Jesus uh, had remained in the grave. It makes a lot more sense 
why these Jews would make these huge shifts if they actually encountered him alive after death. Something would have had to have happened in their midst of, of monumental proportions. Although their message was changing lives, the apostles soon learned that spreading the gospel came with a price. It wasn't long before Christian persecution began. Just like Christ suffered to make the gospel possible, the apostles suffered to make the gospel available. They were persecuted horribly for the stance that they were taking with regard to the resurrection of Jesus. Now, I don't know about, about you, but if it were me, at some point I would say, uh, 